Well, if you would open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. We have been going through a, a, a series that we've called Gospel Community, preceded by a journey through the book of Ruth, and both of those series, I, I hope, have had the effect of, of focusing us on the good news of the gospel and then a particular application of the gospel, which is how we should relate to one another, how we should view one another, treat one another. So if you'll remember, we, we had a message on loving one another earnestly and on forgiveness and on patience. And we, we had a, a message on servanthood and the diversity of the body and its various gifts that Aaron brought to us. We had a message on hospitality. We had a message, uh, obviously, the whole book of Ruth talked to us about the love of God and how that can be reflected towards one another. And th this morning, I, I want to speak from 1 Corinthians, which, which provides something of a perspective, a a sustaining perspective to apply all of those truths. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. I think this passage affects me in thinking about other Christians certainly as much as, if not more than, any other passage in the Bible. I don't know that there is a passage of scripture that more greatly informs my view of, of leadership, or you could apply this to caring for others, than the following passage. So I'm honestly honored to walk through these verses this morning. Let's read it together, beginning in verse 4. I give thanks to my God always for you. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would imprint this passage onto my heart, onto all of our hearts, onto the heart of our church, by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is a celebration of grace. It's really what it is. It's, it's Paul celebrating grace, but it's Paul celebrating grace with a, a perspective, a viewpoint that lifts us above our ordinary perspective. It sort of lifts our gaze and a viewpoint beyond the ordinary ins and outs of the Christian life to a, a magnificent view of this Corinthian church. I, I remember when I was in college, I lived uh, outside of Denver, 
and I loved to go skiing. I, I couldn't do it all the time, but I, I loved to do it when we could. And so we would, we would go up to the uh, mountains, and if you've ever skied in the Rockies, it, it is just, I mean, I'm sure there's better places in Europe, but in terms of my experience, uh, this was incredible. Now, it's obviously beautiful driving up through the mountains in the winter. There's snow, and the trees are beautiful, and there's rocky outcroppings and scenic overlooks and everything. But nothing quite compared to when you would get to the, the place and you would pay your ticket and go in and you get on these ski lifts and they, they lift you up the mountain and you go higher and higher, but you're facing sort of away from, from the slope. And you keep going and gradually, as you would rise up these ski lifts, you would see more and more peaks. You would lift above the trees and then above the hills immediately around you and finally you would get to the top. And you would stand there and you would see these peaks extending for mile after mile, covered with snow, massive mountain chain of the Rocky Mountains. It, it extends across virtually the entirety of the, of the country and goes beyond that. And, and you, you can just see, as far as your eyes can see, you see these, these mountainous peaks. It was, it was magnificent. It's beautiful driving there and walking around in the snow. But once you get to the top, it is magnificent. It is a magnificent perspective. That's what Paul is doing here. He's lifting the perspective of the Corinthians and every other person who's read this book, every other Christian, from the, the normal, ordinary viewpoint of the Christian and, and lifting their gaze above that to see the magnificent celebration and creation of God's grace that is this church. That's what he's doing. It's a celebration of grace. And yet the context of this book and the rest of this book makes this even more miraculous because the Corinthian church was a mess. If you've ever read this book, you know their, their messes were not limited to one room. It was as though a three-year-old child has run throughout the house pulling everything out of every room and rendering every possible conceivable catastrophe. And every room you go into, there's a new mess. That, that was the Corinthian church. I remember one time we, we were, when my wife and I were first married, we were living with the family and they had a, a young boy who, like many young boys, uh, chose to get into trouble. Well, one time what he did was he, he pulled out the fish food uh, from his, underneath his fish tank and he had poured it, I think it was onto his bed, all of the fish food, and then he had subsequently poured water onto the fish food onto his bed. And so now you have fish food and water all over his bed. Well, the Corinthian church is like as if he had done that in every room in the house, pulled out every consumer conceivable thing that could be disorganized was disorganized. That's the Corinthian church, okay? I mean, these people, they're selfish. There's division going on. I mean, if you read later in the book, they're, they're proud and arrogant about their spiritual gifts. They, they, they don't understand. There's gender blurring, gender distinctions that are not being clarified in the church. They have a, a very dangerous immorality situation that they're not handling appropriately. I mean, this church is a disaster. And not only all of that, there's people in the church who are not looking uh, respectfully towards Paul, and they've chosen to forget his role in planting the church, and so he's writing to this people of divided heart towards him. I mean, the church is a disaster. And then you read the opening paragraph. Paul walks in to the Corinthian church a house full of mess, and he says, I give thanks to God always for you. Magnificent. Paul's perspective is magnificent precisely because it is directed towards this highly imperfect church. Highly imperfect. This paragraph is so encouraging, encouraging in, in multiple directions. It's encouraging towards us when our hearts are a mess like the Corinthians are. It is encouraging to apply Paul's words to my own heart. That Paul can say this about the Corinthians. He certainly can say this about me when, when my heart is a mess. It's encouraging when you think about other people. That Paul can say this about other people who are a mess 
motivates me when I think about other people who are a mess and whose mess gets on me sometimes. It's encouraging to think about a church in a corporate sense, a church that has many imperfections and many problems and many needs and many weaknesses, that Paul can apply this to a church corporately is so encouraging. That's why this passage has had such an impact on me and I know on on many. Because he, he lifts their eyes above the mess to see the magnificence. The magnificence of grace. This passage calls us to celebrate grace in imperfect Christians. That's the claim of this passage. Celebrate grace in imperfect Christians, of whom I and you are one. (laughs) Celebrate grace in imperfect Christians. That's the claim of the passage. Now, in order to do that, in order to to celebrate grace the way Paul does, and frankly, I I don't know about you, but Paul's example here uh, is challenging. I, I feel like I strain towards it, but he is out of reach many times. But I, I want to be like him. I am I'm prone to have my eyes towards the mess. Paul is prone to have his eyes toward the magnificence, and I need constant help. I need Paul to, to help me, lift me up, and show me again, Paul, the magnificence, because my eyes are fixed on the mess. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we be like Paul and celebrate grace in the midst of imperfect Christians? Well, two things, two points, seeing grace and trusting God. Seeing grace and trusting God. There are two points, really, because there's two sentences in this paragraph. Paul, uh, as you know, is prone to these incredibly long run-on sentences. Uh, That's no exception. Verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 is one sentence. Uh, So that's our first point. It'll be by far the longest point. And then there's a brief but important point in verse 9, trusting God. So seeing grace and trusting God. Seeing grace. Let's, let's look at this long sentence. Seeing grace. Paul first talks about the source of grace. The source of grace is God, and God in particular working through Jesus Christ and his work in the gospel. Verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you. Notice the comprehensive language. I give thanks to my God always always, and who's it for? For you, shocking you, Corinthians, because of the grace of God. Grace is one of the most important words in the Bible. Unmerited favor to people who should be punished. If you want a definition of grace, unmerited favor to people who should be punished. So what does he give thanks for? To God, because of unmerited favor to people who should be punished. And how is it given? In Christ Jesus, the one who died in the place of sinners and lavished on them his righteousness on their behalf. So the source of this grace is God. Paul doesn't direct it to himself as the church planter. He's not primarily directing it to these people. His his eyes are upward and his view is toward the magnificent because he is determined that God receive the glory. Very important. Paul is not flattering the Corinthians. He is accurately seeing what God has done. This is not Flattery. It is not flattery. Flattery is just making up positive traits that you hope might be true. Paul, no, he is seeing the source of real grace in their life that they have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of all their mess, their divisions, and their proud, and their failure to rebuke this immorality case in their midst, and all of these messes. And he sees right through all of that and says, God has given you grace in Jesus Christ. And I thank my God always because of the grace given you in Jesus Christ. Why? Because anytime God is the source of grace, he deserves to be worshiped. And no amount of mess can obscure Paul's determination to celebrate grace in these imperfect Christians. The source of grace, he points them to first. God has been at work in you, Corinthians. There's only one source for your salvation. It is God in Christ. And I want to celebrate that, he says. That's the source of grace. Then Paul starts to talk about the gifts of grace. Incredible. Notice down there at verse 5. The result of this grace is not simply salvation, but salvation that brings them a richness in Christ, particularly, as he references here, in spiritual gifts. 
Notice that. There's a richness. Verse 5. That, that, let me point out, I, I can see a little more detail of specific grace that has come to you, that in every way you were enriched in him, that all the, all the gifts of grace are in the sphere that is Christ. You notice that in the Bible. Uh, Jesus, obviously, is a person, but it's also this, this category of blessing. Sometimes Jesus is, is the title of, of the sphere of salvation blessings. So as it is here, in every way you were enriched in him since you have been brought into Christ. In that sphere, God has poured out on you the richness in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. Now here's why this is incredible encouragement. He moves from the source to the gifts of grace. Here's why this is specifically encouraging. Spiritual gifts was one major way the Corinthians were failing as a church. It was a category of misapplication. They were proud. They had people in the church that looked down on others. They presumed a superiority because of certain gifts that they exercised in their spiritual body. Here's what's incredible. Paul's going to get to multiple chapters of trying to help them reorient their thinking and move away from pride and towards humility and away from selfishness and towards love. And you have all those chapters in 12, 13, and 14 about if I have all these things but I don't have love, I'm like a clanging gong. That's the church he's talking to. And yet, in the opening paragraph, he specifically singles out gifts as a illumination of the way God has poured out his kindness on them. So he goes right to an area where there is apparent misapplication and failure and pride in the abuse of these gifts, and he says, I'm so grateful that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift. All your speech and your knowledge is just evident of God at work in you. <laughs> That's incredible. Think about how contrary that is to, to how I normally operate. Man, we got a major mess, major mess in this Corinthian church. It's their spiritual gifts. They use them like a rod to beat people, okay? This is really bad. Paul says, I'm amazed that God has given you these wonderful gifts. Paul is not distracted by the misapplication of the gifts of God. He's first amazed at the presence of the gifts of God. He's not distracted by the misapplication. He's first amazed by the presence of those gifts. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? He's amazed that God has gifted them in every way. Now, now, now I think normally when I, when I think about encouraging somebody, I tend to ignore their weak areas and hope that I can find enough obviously pure, strong areas to counterbalance areas they're weak. So we might say things like, well, um, you know, he's really impatient. But you're a hard worker. Thanks for being a hard worker. You're also impatient. But you're a hard worker. You're, you know, or we might come to a person and say, um, you know, I, I love how merciful you are. Now, over here, uh, wow, you, you are, you're good at organizing, but you're, you're, you're really harsh when you do that. But let's focus on over here. In this occasion, you're merciful. That's really good. Thanks for being merciful. Paul doesn't do that. He goes to where they are misapplying. He says, look at this arrogance and pride, superiority. But I can, look at that. That's God's grace. That gift that's being misapplied, it's a gift of grace. I see it. He's seeing grace. Pa Paul has eyes shaped to see grace even in the midst of the darkness of misapplication and immaturity. Even in the precise area of misapplication and immaturity. Think, think about this, say, in the context of marriage. If you're, if you're married, you know you have areas in your spouse's wife where they're, they're really good and strong at something. But also, if you flip that around, that's also an area where there, there also can be super annoying and sinful at times. So you have a, a, a spouse, maybe, who's, who's really funny and relational and, and just such a gift in so many ways. And yet the flip side of that is they're not very organized and they forget things a lot. 
and that can be burdensome. Or you get a person that's, that's real organized and orderly and disciplined, say, for example, and, and, but you look at that person, you think, yeah, but you, you're also going to be condescending and, and selfish in the way you apply that. But Paul is able to see right through the misapplication and say, I'm grateful for the grace that's there. I'm so grateful for the grace that's there in you. And he says it, it's apparently, with this smiling face. He's not trying to trick them. I'm really grateful for this. If you know he's aware, your mass application is horrendous. Oh, you're horrendously using this gift. But he's celebrating grace, even in areas of weakness. You're not lacking in any spiritual gift. Is that what you would say to somebody who's proud about their spiritual gifts? I have the most impressive gifts of anybody. You're not lacking in anything. When you say, let's tone it down a bit there. Okay, let's just back off a skosh and remember that many of us have many gifts and you're not all that impressive and you also have a number of other. No, he says, amen, brother. You do have a lot of gifts. It's astonishing. Why does he do this? He's not tricking them. He genuinely is aware of the magnificence of, rather than being undone by the mess. He keeps going. The source of grace is God. He talks about the gifts of grace. And then he says that there's security in grace. These gifts that they have are given to them as they wait for the revealing of their Lord and our Lord, Jesus Christ. And then he says this incredible promise in verse 8. Who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, or that might be blameless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Paul's confidence is incredible to me. I mean, would you say that to this church? I mean, they, they can't even be servants in the middle of the Lord's Supper. Apparently in the Corinthian church, some people brought a whole meal and ate it as their Lord's Supper and watched other people eat nothing. That's the Corinthian church. I mean, they're not servant-hearted. And, and, and Paul says, he'll sustain you to the end. He'll sustain you to the end, guiltless. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, he will sustain you. He will, he will present you, Christians, on that day in such a way that you will not face the judgment of God. How can he say that? How can he have that confidence? Well, because he's seen grace and its power instead of weaknesses. He's seeing God's ability rather than seeing their inability. He's seeing God's intention to present them that way as more powerful than their failure to act out what they should be doing. That's Paul's perspective. Paul lives on the mountaintop. He lives there. Now, it's not that he's not able to go down into the valley and say, Brothers, I appeal to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and there be no divisions among you, as he says there in verse 1. Or if you move over to chapter 5, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And then he keeps going and he talks about let each person live as you were called. And then he appeals to them, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. And then he keeps going. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And then he says, the result of that is, brothers, flee from idolatry. Now, Paul's able to get into the trees. Very able, very able to get into the trees and get down there with him and say, this, this, this is the problem. Let me help you think this way. This is wrong. Change your thinking here. This is inaccurate. Stop doing this. Stop fighting. He's able to get down there and do work down there, but he never loses the mountain perspective. He never loses it. And there's a reason it comes first. There's a reason it comes first. It positions him. It helps them understand, look, I want you to know of the magnificent grace that I see in you, grace that has gifted you 
in every way and grace that will sustain you to the end in spite of your current imperfections, in spite of the horrendous mess you have made of this church. In the end, you Christian Corinthians, God will make it so you'll stand before him and not be judged, not be punished. Right now it looks bad, but God will sustain you. How do we apply this first point, seeing grace? I think we can apply it uh, sort of in three different directions. We can apply it first to ourselves. This verse should be so encouraging to you. It should be so encouraging to you. Think right now of your most besetting sin tendency. I have them, you have them. Think, think what it is. Is it anger? Is it lust? Is it selfishness? Is it laziness? What is it? I'm fairly confident that your besetting sin tendency was somewhere reflected in the Corinthian church. Uh, almost no messes that they weren't very familiar with, okay? Receive these words from the Lord. I thank my God always for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. You've been enriched in every way. You're not lacking in any spiritual gift. And you know what? You'll be sustained till the end, guiltless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Apply this to your own heart. Look, look, look at your own heart and let the word of God lift you from the fear and anxiety that comes when you look at your most besetting sin tendencies, which all of us have and all of us struggle with. And even others at times can remind us of, and it's discouraging and depressing when they do because we're aware of some level of the truth of what they're saying. And we need to let Paul lift us above that and say, yes, yes, that, that, that's true. We have things to work on. We always will. And yet see the grace of God at work and the security of that grace that will sustain you to the end, Christian. In spite of your weakness, in spite of your failure, in spite of your imperfections, Paul comes in and says, yes, but I thank my God for you because grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, favor towards those who should have been punished that's what God sees in you. Apply that to your own heart. Apply that to your heart. If, if this week you gave in to a particular sin tendency that you've been fighting for years, apply the promise of this word to your heart. We need to apply this to our own messy Hearts. We also need to apply it um, sort of corporately as a church. I, I mean, just as, from a leadership perspective, it shocks me that Paul can, can just so freely lavish encouragement. Wouldn't you think that this kind of lavish encouragement, Paul, I, you know, I'm a little concerned that they're not going to feel the danger they're in. Why don't we withhold encouragement just in case they take that the wrong way <laughs> and, and don't feel the correction they need. This is a stick moment, not a carrot moment, Paul. <laughs> but, but to this messy church, he, he celebrates grace for them corporately. Now, of course, I could be completely blind and self-serving in this, but I think all of you bear no resemblance to the Corinthian church as a church. I think you serve and love one another. And one of the reasons I wanted to preach this passage is to say that, and as we celebrate this bittersweet Sunday of our last Sunday in this building, I, I wanted to just thank God for you as a church. And thank God that in so many ways you're not like the Corinthians, though what is true of you in the Lord was true of them. But, but I, I thank God for you, not only in the magnificence, but, but down in some of the details. I can point out the way people serve and that there, there, there is not these, these strife and angry division that seems to be present here and the, the kind of superiority of some gifts over the others that seem to be present here. And so as we reach the conclusion of this opening phase of our, our 
little church that we have here. I, I just wanted to thank God for you and say God has enriched you in every way. And more important than that, he has saved you in Christ Jesus. And, and he has also promised to sustain you to the end, Redemptional Church, so that as we, as we look forward to a new building and a new season and many families being sidelined and all the new challenges that every new season presents in every life of the church, I, I want us to see grace in the life of our church. It is grace that has sustained us to this point. Only grace. It's unmerited favor. It's not because we have particularly godly leaders. Quite the contrary. It's not because we have these incredibly gifted people. No, quite the contrary, naturally. No, no, no. The reason that we've been sustained to this point is the grace of God, the unmerited favor to people who should have been punished, but instead are experiencing church community and love and servanthood, are not alienated from one another, are not alienated from God. Why? Because they've been given grace in Christ Jesus. So I just want to, want to raise up a, a, a memorial as we move from one building to the next and say God has given grace to Redemption Hill Church. Amen. Another application of seeing grace is seeing grace in church members, family members, fellow care group members, other members of the church. We must see grace in each other. We must. We will never, ever be a true gospel community unless we discipline ourselves to go to the mountaintop with Paul and see the magnificence rather than the mess. All of these previous messages we've been doing on gospel community, forgiveness and patience and love and servanthood and hospitality, they must be sustained by the disciplined return to this perspective. They must be sustained by the dis because people are messy and I am messy. And you get down into the weeds of people's life and my heart and you realize, oh my goodness. These people have all kinds of messes all the time. I, I had two different occasions this week where I had to go to a member of the church and say, would you please forgive me? I, I, I failed. I failed in this way. I was selfish and lazy, and I didn't do what I said I would do. Would you please forgive me? Now, apart from the gospel and apart from this perspective, I have no reason to assume that those two people and countless others over the years have any reason to love me again or to forgive me again or to partner with me again. I have no reason to assume that. Why should they do that? Wouldn't they move on? But this perspective lifts them above the inconvenience and pain and difficulty that is me and gives them perspective about God's grace. And we need that towards one another because we're prone to see the mess rather than the grace. We're prone to be like someone who has 20-20 vision in Christ, but in our sin, in our tendency, we, we, we choose to pick up an unnecessary prescription put it on over our eyes, and walk out into the world seeing correction more than we see grace. We have the wrong kind of corrective lenses, don't we? Weaknesses. There they are. <laughs> and it's important to understand, it's not as though grace is this rose-covered flattery that, you know, I just want to see you in the best side of you. I, I want to see you as a glass mostly full when you're really mostly empty. No, no. Paul's not lying. He's accurate. The grace they have received really is magnificent and really should be seen and celebrated. And the same is true for every Christian that we interact with. And yet our, our tendency is to, to put on these corrective lenses and see their weaknesses exaggerated and their graces minimized and to see their weaknesses more consistently than we see their grace and the grace that God has given to them. Let's see 
and celebrate the grace of God in one another. This is a discipline. This is a discipline. It takes regular hard work. You will not build a lifetime of seeking grace unless you choose to see grace in difficult moments. Let me say that again. We will not build a lifetime of seeing grace unless we choose to see grace in difficult moments. We will not. A lifetime is built of individual decisions. A lifetime is built of individual decisions. If there ever was a time for Paul to give himself a pass and say, surely I can just jump right into correction with the Corinthians. I mean, this is a difficult, difficult moment. They don't respect me. They don't respect what God has said. This is a moment to get to correction. Paul gives himself no pass. The discipline of gratefulness got to be applied right now. If it ever has to be applied, it has to be applied right now. Think about difficult moments, difficult moments with your children. Difficult moments with your children when you just, the mess is apparent. The sin is apparent. The weakness is apparent. The inability is apparent. And the discipline of seeing grace. How is grace at work in your life? And even if they're not saved, so these things can't be said of them, more than likely there is some evident common grace at work in their life. Some vestige of the image of God that can still be celebrated, though they need the gospel. I remember hearing a story about a parent one time whose uh, daughter was going through this incredible, difficult, and kind of alienating time with the family, and the relationship wasn't strong, and he just determined to practice what he called affirmation. I don't even know if she was saved, but he was going to point out the glimpses of the image of God still present in her little life and heart. So he walked into a room, which is a disaster, he said, and constantly was, but he saw on her dresser uh, that her perfume was set up in an order, short, medium, tall. And so he walked in. He said, you know, honey, I love how you've ordered your perfume like that. That reminds me of God. God is an orderly God. You have reflected him in some small way. Walked out of the room and went away. (laughs) I thought, that is discipline right there. And with Christians, we have so much more than we can say. We need to see grace in our fellow members. We need to see it in our spouses, husbands, and wives. We must see grace, the discipline of seeing grace, because weaknesses and sins shout for our correction, and our pride loves to focus on the weaknesses of others. And yet God has been so kind to give us this perspective and say, you should be able to see and celebrate grace. And we want this atmosphere in the church. So, so, What are some practices? We should celebrate grace before we confront sin. We should celebrate grace before we confront sin. Make that a practice. I would just make it a normal discipline that you never confront or even inquire about the possibility of sin or weakness without first celebrating grace. Make celebrating grace the atmosphere Not flattery. This is why it takes discernment and discipline. Not flattery. You're so great. You're just such a great person. What do you mean by that? You're, well, you're you're great. You're wonderful. I appreciate you because you're you. Okay, that's a that's first step. But let's fight for, for grace. I am grateful for you. I'm grateful to God that He has saved you. Looking at you is a reminder that there's a gospel. Paul seems to see people almost like we look at words that we sing on the screen. He sees people and he says, praise God, glorify God, how good God is. Look, there's another reminder, death to life, grace instead of punishment, sustaining power instead of weakness. Oh, glory to God, he says. We need to do that towards one another. So when you're in small group 
and you notice the person who says something um, about how I, I'm just struggling again, I, I'm, I'm feeling again in this area, and I, I just wanted to confess that to everybody. Our, our instinct, our prompting should be, that person needs to be lifted back to the magnificent perspective. We, we need to get down and help them grow, and sure, point this out. This isn't a good way to walk out your life. Let's, let's talk about that. Sure, we'll get there, but, but, but we need to start by bringing them up the mountain and saying, yeah, but let, let's just remember something. The gospel is true for you, and that's much more important than your ongoing growth. We, we gotta grow. Let me point out, there's ways you can apply the gospel. You you should love others. You're not loving others, but let's start here. God has loved you. Let's start there. Let's start there with one another. God has loved you, Christian. He's given you grace. The discipline of seeing grace, preceding correction with encouraging grace. Don't let sins and weakness blind you to the opportunity of celebrating grace. Don't let sins and weakness blind us to the opportunity of celebrating grace. And I mean real grace. I don't mean easy grace. You're hearing me say that loud and clear. I believe that the church is called to speak the truth in love, to encourage and correct false doctrine and false practice. I believe that. But it should be done in an atmosphere of seeing grace from the top of that mountain. It's amazing what you can say to people. But when you start at the base and you start pointing out weaknesses without having seen grace, oh, there's so much doubt and question. It's difficult to receive. From that mountain, God loves you and I am grateful for you and God will sustain you to the end and he's been faithful to you. Now, you see down there, th that part of your life, it doesn't seem to be in line with the gospel, but that comes very differently when you're standing with them on the mountain of grace and declaring over them the magnificence that God has been at work in their life. We must see grace in ourselves, in the church, in one another. Final point, more briefly, trusting God. Trusting God. Trusting God. Paul has this, after his long sentence, this brief, emphatic sentence in verse 9. Brief and emphatic. In the original, the opening of the sentence is just these, these, these words. Faithful God. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Paul, Paul gets to the end of the sentence, and, and it's as though he himself has to get down to the core. You can almost feel him. I'm sure even in his own heart, there was some level of, man, can I really say this to them? <laughs> can I really say to them, God will sustain you to the end. He's enriched you in every way. Maybe I should start the letter over. I mean, can I really say this to them? And then you can feel him even speak almost to his own heart. Faithful God! Why? Why can we see grace? It's because we trust God and God's character that has been displayed by calling people into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. What's the chief evidence of that faithfulness by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord? How do we know God is faithful? Well, he's the one that called you into the fellowship of his son. That God will surely be faithful to sustain you to the end. That God that called you into the fellowship of his own son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, will certainly fulfill all of these explosions of grace that I've just lavished on you. Seeing grace is sustained by trusting God. Seeing grace in other people is sustained by trusting God. We will not see grace unless we're looking at God, unless we're looking at the faithfulness of God displayed in the salvation of sinners called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. We will not see grace in our fellow sinners. If our eyes are on sinners, we will see their sin. If our eyes are on God and we descend from gazing at God to look at our fellow sinners, then we'll begin to see God at work in them. God is faithful, Paul says. God is faithful. God is true. God is steadfast. God is powerful. God can call sinners into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is the sovereign. God is the powerful one. God gives 
sovereign grace to those who were running from him. He saves sinners and brings them into the family room of heaven. He calls people who were chasing hell and starts them chasing heaven. God is able to do these things. Therefore, Corinthians, I thank my God always, even for you. I'm celebrating grace, Paul says, in its richness and security, not because of some faithfulness I see in you. Doesn't this correct the uncertain tone we often apply to other people? I hope you grow. I hope you make it. The I hope you make it is not, it's not really a, a fully fledged biblical warning. You don't look so good to me. Especially when it's not surrounded by the assurance of God's grace. The Bible says grow, change, improve, examine yourself. But it says that in the context of God's sovereign, sustaining grace. We should too. I would encourage you to ask your close friends in private, one-on-one, your children if you have them, your spouse if you have one, the following difficult but crucial question. Do I communicate grace to you more than I communicate correction towards you? Are you more aware of my confidence in God for you or my dislike of your weaknesses? Are you more aware of my confidence in God for you or of my dislike of your weaknesses? I would encourage you, ask your spouse that question. And if she or he says, honestly, and I would, I would, I would say you, you probably want to preface this with saying, by the grace of God, I will not get angry at you when you answer me. <laughs> and then don't. <laughs> if you have to close your eyes and bite your tongue and run out of the house screaming, don't get angry at them. Just receive their honest perspective it's probably more accurate than you'd like to admit. Are you more aware of my confidence in God for you or my dislike of your weaknesses? Apply this to your own heart first. All of us, (laughs) we hear messages and, and... Names spring to mind. Oh my goodness, they need to hear this one. (laughs) Boy, this is a good one for that person. Can't wait for my spouse to ask me that question. My dad, my mom, my friend. Apply this to your own heart. Am I seeing grace in the hearts of those who are imperfect? Am I good at celebrating grace in imperfect Christians? Now, if you're not, apply it first to yourself. (laughs) God gives grace to sinners who are self-righteous and ungracious towards other sinners. Isn't that the good news of the gospel? God gives grace to sinners who are self-righteous towards other sinners. Now, why he does that is beyond our comprehension. But he does. So if you tend to be self-righteous and they're more aware of your dislike of their weaknesses than your confidence of God and there's conviction that sets in, return to this passage and apply it to your own heart. God says to you and me, Mr. Corinthian superior kind of Christian, think you're better than everybody, I always thank God for you. Now we've got to become less that way, but we, we can enjoy the confidence that God gives them, that God God has worked grace in them. He will continue to work grace in them. He will help them grow. And isn't it so 
difficult and hard to see grace in a person who stubbornly refuses to see their sin? Isn't that so hard to do? Isn't it hard to see grace in a person who stubbornly refuses to see their sin? I think that's incredibly hard to do, to keep encouraging the person who refuses to hear the correction and to say it again. Finally, you think, okay, enough. Enough of the speaking softly. Now it's just the big stick, okay? No more speaking softly. No more speaking grace. Because you're thick, okay? And, and, and you need a stick and not... It's the Corinthians. If Paul can say this to the Corinthians, you and I can say this to anyone. And we can say it at any time that our hearts are a mess as well. God is faithful. Let's speak this into the future of our church. We're moving to a new building. I think if there's anything to the spiritual sensitivity and a leadership calling or whatever, I, I think we're moving into a new phase. We have new people in our church, new members, new people attending us. That means new gifts that get to be displayed. It also means a new set of sin tendencies. And these new people don't really know the rest of us yet because we haven't sinned against them enough uh, for them to know us yet. And so that's going to happen. And they're going to get to know us and think, oh my gosh, you're nicer on Sunday than you are on Wednesday. And you're nicer on Wednesday than you are on Friday. I mean, they're, they're going to see these things and so what do we need we need this perspective and we need to anchor it in verse 9 God is faithful so when I have to call you and say I've sinned against you please return to this passage God is faithful or when you have to refer to each other I, I you know what brother I, I, I have not served you sister I sinned against you in that way forgive my my quick temper Forgive my harsh words. Forgive my insensitivity. Oh, I, I'm, I'm aware of my mess again. Or you bump into someone who is completely oblivious to the way are the others. Do I have to be at church with this oblivious person? Better go back to the mountain. We're moving into a, a new phase, a new season. Moving into this building, it's going to be bigger. That's going to be weird. It's not going to feel full. So there's going to be some little thought of like, man, it's kind of empty in here. We feel kind of alone and echoey a little bit more than we did on Sunday where it's squishy and warm. Where do we go at that moment? Where do we go when we're getting to know somebody we don't like everything we see? Or they're getting to know us, they don't like everything they see. God is faithful. I'm not, and you're not always but God is who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. How, Paul? God is faithful. By whom? you were called into the fellowship of his son. Whew, Corinthians, we've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got a lot of messes to clean up in this church. There is fish food on bed covers and kitchen sinks and couches and the floor and food is in pantry holes and washing machine is covered with Soap and my goodness, we got some work to do. God is faithful. He'll sustain you. I give thanks to God always for you. And I and Aaron, we give thanks to God always for you because of the grace given you in Christ Jesus. And God is faithful who has led us to this point and now leads us as we move in to a new season. Let's go to the top of the mountain and see the magnificence of grace and trust him for the future. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of this opening paragraph 
I pray that this would shape our pursuit of gospel community. I pray it would. I pray it would sustain us when we're called to love the unlovely and the unloving. I pray it would sustain us when we are seeking to be patient with the impatient, to forgive the unforgiving. Lord, I pray it would help us when we experience conviction and would lift us to trust and see your grace and the magnificence of the gospel provision you have made for us. I pray you would lift our gaze and our eyes to look out at the peaks of grace that are evident everywhere in our own journey and in the journey of those around us. And I pray you would keep our eyes fixed on your gracious faithfulness. As we walk through the mundane messes, from one day to the next. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.